Hello, how are you doing? It's a great pleasure being here with you guys. I really thank God for this time because today I want to dissect something a little bit maybe controversial to most of you, but uh, I, I believe this is something that I really needed to speak about because uh, you see, we all have choices. We have all have choices in different things. And my choice was to leave the Pentecostal religion. So most of you might wonder, why are you talking about Pentecostal religion? Is there something uh, different? Is there something which is not right? According to uh, the Bible, I think there are so many things which are really differing uh, with what the Bible says. And I decided that uh, I'm not going to be just, uh, you see, I'm just not going to be uh, sitting down there and not following the Bible because there are so many things which are not really telling with the Bible. And uh, I would like you to do me a favor, wherever you are, just take a little time kindly if you can be able to watch this video to the end and uh, you'll be able to understand why there are some things that you need to open up your eyes especially in africa in in kenya to be particular the pentecostal church is a is quite a uh, vocal and uh, there are some things that you always see in the church and you ask yourself is this really in the bible is this really in the bible some people falling down some people speaking some weird tones and weird tongues and things and you really ask yourself is it really in the bible and uh what does the bible talk about all these things and what might be wrong because in everything you have also to uh, open up your eyes because the bible tells us in first thessalonians 5 uh, 21 to 22 the bible tells us uh, prove all things hold fast uh, that which is good the bible tells us very well prove all things and hold fast that which is good so I have to prove, I have to prove everything. When you hear somebody tell you, don't prove me, don't prove me, don't, don't check anything, uh, which is, no, 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 no. Even, even when Paul was preaching uh, to the Belrians, the Belrians used to listen. Paul has said this, they have to go back to the Bible and see, is it really in the Bible? Because they had to prove everything. And when you see a religion whereby people don't want you to prove anything, there, there might be something which is not right. Uh, and so now, uh, let me, let, me, let me just start a little bit by the history of uh, Pentecostal. I, I went through and I saw the history of Pentecostal churches when it started. And uh, the history says that uh, all these things are in, in Google. You can just go and check them. Eh? Modern Penteco Pentecostalism began uh, in January 1st, that is 1901, when a lady called Agnes Osman, who was a student at Bethel Bible School, in Kansas in the US, spoke in tongues. Actually, the story is that she spoke in Chinese and uh, never spoke English again for several days. So uh, that's, that's the, the whole story about where it all started, around 1901, when uh, that lady spoke, Agnes Osman. And later on, we see the foundation, the whole religion started officially in uh, April 9. Uh, that is in 1906 at the Azusa Street Revival. We have all heard about Azusa Street Revival, which uh, was in LA, California, led by a preacher called William Seymour. And uh, after that, it is spread like a wildfire all across the, the world. So that's a brief history of how the Pentecostal religion started. And uh, I have several reasons which are making me really uh, not be very comfortable uh, 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 with the Pentecostal religion. And these are the reasons that I'm going to uh, write down here. So the first religion is uh, they don't, these guys, they don't rightfully, rightfully divide the Bible. All right. Now, when I say they don't rightfully divide the Bible, most of you might wonder how. But let me tell you, most Pentecostals uh, spend a lot of their time uh, in, at the early book of Acts, uh, applying to themselves what happened on the day of Pentecost. That is where the whole uh, topic of Pentecostal started from, the whole story about Pentecostal. And they really, really, really avoid Apostle Paul. Uh, yes, they might mention, yeah, we also follow Paul, but uh, 
You see, uh, the Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. You see, they may say this, but they don't really follow this. They follow another thing. And we see, if you really follow about what happened in the day of Pentecost, you're literally talking about what uh, you're literally saying, I'm following the apostles, the early apostles, and also Apostle Peter. Because Apostle Peter was the main chief guy who was uh, the vocal guy during the day of Pentecost. And also the early apostles, because we see Paul started way later in in chapter 9 of Acts, and uh, they based most of their doctrines on the early part of the day of Pentecost. And uh, it's, it's, it's not bad to understand what happened in the day of Pentecost, but the Bible tells us one thing. In uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible tells us, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to rightly divide the word of truth from this time to this time to this time. We have to rightly divide the word of truth to understand what happened in this time. Is this message for us? Is this message not for us? You see, the whole Bible is for us to learn, but is not to us. Like, for example, when I say that, you may wonder what am I really saying. But what I'm saying is this. In the Bible, for example, we have a certain guy who was told in the Bible by God to go and make an ark. Are you supposed to make an ark today? Is that message to you or is it for you to learn? Are you, are you understanding the difference? So there's a message which is to you and another which is for you to learn. Okay. So if we hear the, the, what happened in the day of Pentecost... Was that message to us or is it for, for us to learn? And uh, this is something that you have to understand literally very, very clear. And if we understand it very well, we'll not be caught up by all these surprises. So let me just, uh, let me show you something here. Uh, we have uh, a small line here. This is what happened in the day of Pentecost. All right. This is the day of Pentecost. We have uh, uh, up the early apostles and we have also Peter. Let me just put them together at that time. And then we have another guy showing up here called Paul. All right. Uh, actually, I should write Paul here. Um, Paul shows up around here in chapter 9 of Acts. So we have Paul. And then we have, uh, after that, Paul comes in. Then we have, uh, this is the, the tribulation. After Paul, we have what we call the rapture. And then we have the tribulation. And then this is the Armageddon. All right. And then we have a thousand years. A thousand years. That is a millennial kingdom. All right. So now... Seeing something like this, we can be able to understand the day of Pentecost. This, this is all about the time of the church age, all right? This is the church age. This is the church age. So this being the church age, we already see the time of the Pentecost. That is the Apostle Peter, and then later we see Apostle Paul coming in, and then we have the, the rapture happens, and then the tribulation, and then the Armageddon, and then the millennial kingdom. So the Bible tells us, all this time, Peter was speaking to the Jews. All right? It was all about the Jews. And then later we see the transition happening, whereby now it became, the message was all about Gentiles. The message now went to Gentiles, from Jews to Gentiles. There was a transition in the book of Acts. All right? So for most people who don't rightly divide the book of Acts, they'll end up thinking that, you see, we are still here. Because some things were spoken here by Peter, they still apply to us. No. Why do we have Paul in the picture? So if you really follow Peter so much, then you mean that there's something wrong uh, about the Bible talking about Peter. Peter being in the Bible. So we have to really, really understand and ask ourselves, why was uh, Paul in the Bible? So these guys, they believe one thing, that uh, the apostles, let, let, let's just go there, Acts, the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts 2 and see what really happened on the day of Pentecost. What really happened on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2 from verse 1 to 4. 
And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came uh, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And uh, it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So now we see the... The apostles here, them being filled, all right? They were filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? So this one does not mean they never had the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit, but here it was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They were filled because of what? So that they can, be, they can start their great commission of going with a lot of power because... When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a lot of power. You have a lot of faith in doing things. So the essence of being filled by the Holy Spirit is so that you can have power, you see. And uh, they, the apostles already had gotten the Holy Spirit. So we, uh, we can even confirm this. That is, uh, the Bible says, uh, that is in uh, John 20, 21 to 22. The Bible says, he said unto them, peace be with you as my father has sent me. Even so, I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed unto them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Ghost. So we see already Jesus had given them the Holy Spirit. But now here they were being filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that how we are filled with the Holy Spirit now? No. The Bible tells us right now, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So the way we are filled by the Holy Spirit is by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more you hear the word of God, the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, but here they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a specific day. Uh, and also, the Bible tells us right now, in the time of the Gentiles, in Ephesians, the Bible tells us in uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 13, it tells us once you believe, you, have, you receive the Holy Spirit. Immediately you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. I'll be reading that later on. So, if you receive the Holy Spirit immediately here, and here it was different, do you understand those are two different dispensations? These are different transition, all right? Uh, so, another thing, today we don't really follow Peter or the early apostles. We follow Paul. Actually, Paul tells us very well in Romans 11, 13, Paul says, uh, Romans uh, eleven thirteen. he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So Paul tells us, I am the apostles to the Gentiles. So if you want to stay here in Acts 2, then it means you must be a Jew. You must be a Jew. But we are Gentiles, so we are following Paul. We are following Paul. Are you seeing the difference? And uh, even uh, Paul tells us, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be ye followers of me, even I, even as I also I am of Christ. So follow me because I'm also following Christ. Why is Paul telling us to follow him? Because he was revealed the gospel of our dispensation on how we can be able to be saved. So if Paul has already come up and told us, hey, this is how you're going to be saved by the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then why are you going to another dispensation? Why are you going to another different time? Because here Paul, we see, he's saying one thing. Uh, he, he was asked by some guy, ha, men and brethren, we see, yes, we have already killed Jesus after he has, um, after the whole ordeal. He has, he, he's told guys, hey, you know you killed your Messiah. And then he's, they ask him, so now what do we do so that we may be saved? He says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So right now, these guys, the Pentecostals, they, they take that message and say, now, unless you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, with, the, with water, you get inside water, you cannot... You cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Water. All right? It's like you're fulfilling with water. Does the Bible really say water cleanses anything? Because what's the reason? Why, why are people baptized? What, what, what's the reason for baptism? You see, you have to understand something about everything. What, why do people get baptized? When you, you are baptized is when you receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible says... Repent and be baptized and you will receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the main reason that you get the Holy Spirit is through baptism. But we see later on, this is not what is happening during the time of the Gentiles. We are seeing that in Ephesians 1.13, the Bible says, In whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you trusted, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So once you believe, you get the Holy Spirit. So now here, getting the Holy Spirit had to be by water. So these guys here, they base their doctrine on this, that you have to get inside water and be baptized so that you can get the Holy Spirit. And also others, they say they have, you have to be laid on hands and all that. And I used to see so much, you know, I've gone in these many, many, many prayer meetings and uh, you see that uh, you hear it today in the afternoon, we are going to be having an infilling of the Holy Spirit and you see all this is going to happen and just come here and then you're taught how to receive the Holy Spirit. Can you really teach the Holy Spirit? Can you really teach how someone can get the Holy Spirit? Is it really possible that some guy can lay hands on you and tell you, repeat this. You see, I went in one of the meetings and then we are there raising our hands and then, you know, the, the preacher says something, then we, people, we all fall down. Of course, I fell down because I was pushed by some people. Uh, and then when we are falling down there, people are crying, others are doing some weird, weird stuff. Oh, hey, hey. They are crying, others are, it's like they are rolling and women are, there are some ushers who are just going with some bed sheets, uh, Keep putting the, the the bed sheets on top of the legs of women because the legs are all, 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 all open like this. And you really ask yourself, is this really godly? Do you think God would want such kind of a thing to happen in his house? People are really showing their nakedness and others are like they are demon possessed. They are running up and down and they are rolling and they are... You really ask yourself, what's really happening? What is this? What is this? For sure... I don't know if it's, that is really biblical and if it's in the Bible. Because there's no one place in the Bible where we can see such kind of a proof. And even, forget about the baptism. They say that, <laughs> let me just show you here. They say that when you receive the Holy Spirit, then you must speak in tongues. Let me write here. So number two is uh, you have to, you have to be baptized in water now that aspect of water let, let me before i come to the next point let me show you why water is not even important go to go with me go with me to colossians colossians 2 uh 2 12 all right the bible says buried with him in baptism so we are buried with who with christ buried with him in baptism Wherein you are also risen with him through faith in the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. So you are buried with Christ in baptism and you are also raised with him. So if you are raised and buried and raised by faith with Jesus in baptism, so you get baptized. We are told that we are baptized in, uh, we, we, are, we have one baptism which is in Christ. So if the baptism is one and it is by faith, then what are you doing in water? What's the difference between getting inside water and when you ask someone, they will tell you, you see, water is just an, a, a, an outside way of showing your faith from inside. So what's the difference between that and uh, having that, that, that sculpture of Jesus and uh, going to bow onto it? And when you ask, why are you praying to this sculpture, which is Jesus, uh, you know, uh, a wood, piece of wood, you say, you see, this sculpture is just all about, I'm expressing my faith just by action. You see, what's the difference between worshipping idol and also getting in water? What, what's the difference? There's no difference. Because this one is just an image to show what is the faith is. And also, that sculpture, that idol is also an image. So both of them are images because you've been told it is now by faith. So what are you doing in water? And the Bible has told us it's by faith. So those are some of the things that I don't understand. And if the Bible has already told us, once you get saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit immediately. And we knew that water was to give someone, a baptism by water was to give someone the Holy Spirit. Then you already have the Holy Spirit. Then what, what else are you looking for in water? What else are you looking for in water? You see the, the difference? And if really water was so important, then why is it not a must? 
Some people can get into water, others can't, you, you see. No, 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 I have asked so many of them. Is it really a must that you have to get inside water to be saved? They say, no, you see, it's just like fulfilling everything. It's not really a must. You can go to hell because of water. Then why are you teaching it? If this is not a must, then why are you teaching it? You see, those are some of the things that I could not really agree with them. Let's see another reason, which uh, I really was out, all right, is the whole aspect of speaking in tongues. Speaking, speaking in tongues. So these guys, they say, the moment you, uh, you're saved, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the evidence is speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Is uh, that what the Bible says? How can you be filled with power, with faith, with the Holy Spirit? You're filled with the Holy Spirit by faith. Faith comes be, by hearing and hearing the word of God. So it's by hearing the word of God that you get to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the moment you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, you have the Holy Spirit. So you only feel it becomes more and more and more inside you. That by reading the word of God, by understanding the word of God, is not by... A specific day, all right, or something happening. So speaking in tongues, let me come to this. Let me come to this. The tongues that these guys speak, they are literally weird. It's not what we see, the tongues. It's not the same tongues which are spoken at the day of Pentecost. You say, they, they say we follow the day of the Pentecost. But now the day of Pentecost, these people are not speaking the same tongues that these guys today speak. These guys do something you call babbling. They speak things that even the person who is speaking the tongues, he cannot tell you what he has said. He cannot even interpret what he's saying. There is not even an interpreter who can tell you what they are saying. It's not even a language. It's something different. Is that what the, the apostles were speaking in the day of Pentecost? Were they babbling? Let's see that. In Acts, Acts 2. Let's just go back there. Let's see what exactly, what tongues were they speaking with? Acts 2. And we can see from uh, 6 to 11. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded be be because ev that every man heard them speak in his own language. So these guys were speaking in the language of the people who were there. All right? A language. A spoken, written language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? You see? So they knew these people speak Galileans. <laughs> Why are they speaking in our languages? All right? Verse 8. And how we hear every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Pharisians and Medes and Ephlamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phygithia, Pamphylia in Egypt and parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So these apostles were not speaking any other thing. They were speaking a specific tongue. It was a written and spoken, both written written and spoken a written and spoken language that is the tongue that they were speaking they were not babbling they were not just saying things that they cannot be able to un to be understood they were not just saying things because of the aspect of saying no they were speaking tongues literal languages all right why, is this, why was it important for these people to speak in tongues? Because the Bible tells us one thing. These people, the Jews, they had to hear tongues. Tongues are a sign, all right? And the Bible tells us very well. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Bible tells us, For the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. So Jews require what? A sign. All right? But the Greeks, which are the Gentiles, require a uh, they, they seek after wisdom. Okay? Wisdom. Or right now, the, the, we, we say that we live by faith. Okay? Faith. Faith and here they live by sight. Alright? They have to see to believe. 
Do you know that in the Bible, all through the Israelites were always given different sights, uh, signs by God. They were always told this and this and this and this, and God was always giving them different signs. I remember the time of uh, when they were coming out from, uh, from Egypt to uh, Canaan. By the day, they were, there was a, a cloud, a cloud. Uh, was it cloud or fire at night? Fire was at night and then during the day was a cloud. They had to see signs. Even when Jesus came, he had to show great signs and wonders and all those things so that they can believe. So the Jews loved signs. So there had to be signs so that they can believe. But right now, do we live by signs or do we live by faith? Today we live by faith. We don't live by sight. All right. So the sight were for the Jews. All right. So tongues are for a sign to the non-believers so that they can be able to hear where a foreigner is preaching. So these guys who are, who are hearing these signs, those who are hearing these tongues, eh, they were people who are not saved so that they see this sign and they can be able to say, wow, these people are speaking in our languages, speaking the wonderful works of God, speaking great things that the Lord has done in our language. So it's really important to understand this and to understand why there had to be a sign. There had to be speaking of tongues. You see, even today, you can pray to God and tell him, God, please, I need you to give me the gift of tongues because I am in a place where people cannot be able to hear and understand my language. So I'm praying, Lord, that you may give me the gift of tongues so that I can prophesy and I can speak and preach to someone who is an unbeliever who maybe speaks a different language. For example, you go to Spanish and to Spain and you, you, you're English, you're speaking in English. You can tell God, please give me the gift of tongues. And you can start speaking in Spanish, Cardu Vilbeniz. You can say, you know, that means uh, may God bless you. You can start speaking in French. Mm? You can start speaking in Chinese. You can start speaking in different language. You understand? So, yes, the gifts are always there. But they are given for a purpose. They are given to the non to, to the believers to speak to the non-believers. Is that what happens today in the Pentecostal churches? Let's see. First Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14. Uh, let's this, see this. First Corinthians 14, 22. The Bible says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So tongues are for those who don't believe. Then if they are for those who don't believe, then what are you doing with signs? Or what are you doing with these tong tongues? You're actually in a very different <laughs> road. Okay? Those are some of the things which really confused me in so much. For over 30 years, I was always thinking that because I cannot speak in tongues, then I think uh, I'm not really, really 100%, you know, right with God and all those kind of things. And they made me always feel guilty and feel guilty. And it's not only me alone. So many people, they could not be able to speak in tongues in, in this Pentecostal church because if you are legitimately trying to find the tongues, then you cannot find them because it's something that you're taught. If you're waiting for the Holy Spirit to teach you how to speak in tongues, then it has to be for a certain purpose. But this other one which you're taught for your own way or something, then I think there's something really, really wrong. And even the Bible says, whoever is speaking in tongues, whoever is speaking in tongues, he only edifies himself. He does not edify the church. He does not edify anyone. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 4. The Bible says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. So if you are only edifying yourself, then why are you making noise to people in church? Others who want to pray, others who want to listen to the word, others, I always see in these Pentecostal churches, when somebody starts speaking in tongues, you will, you will hear the prayers going on and then somebody is shouting uh, in tongues, another one is shouting there, another one is shouting there, is a real confusion. When you enter there, you'll be like, wow, what are these people really doing? It's really noisy. It's noisy here. I can't even, uh, just imagine an unbeliever. Or someone who doesn't understand about tongues and is the first time he's getting to church and he finds people, everybody shouting his own things. Will they not think you're really confused? Actually, the Bible tells us about that. <laughs> see here, see in, uh, all right, 
<laughs> verse 23 of uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23. Listen what it says. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? You see what the Bible is saying? Will they people not say, eh, these people, I think they must be mad. There must be something really, really, which is not right, which is happening here. Why are these people speaking these weird languages? Why are these people speaking like this? Hmm? And the Bible tells us very well, be organized, be organized. So tongues are made to be spoken when there is a foreign, uh, when, when there is someone who can be able to translate. So if you're speaking in those uh, mysterious languages, I'm not saying they are not there because the Holy Spirit can speak to you or you can speak to the Holy Spirit in a mysterious tongue. You can be in a position whereby you cannot be able to utter any word, but you can only utter in your thoughts and you can only utter something that only God himself can understand. That is okay. I'm not, I'm not against speaking in tongues, but I'm against the whole thing of making tongues to be like the whole doctrine of the church. Uh, the Bible tells us something totally different here. Actually, the Bible give us, gives us the rules of using tongues. It gives us rules. If you want to speak in tongues, this is, these are the rules. Let's read some of the rules. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 to 33. The Bible says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, that, one, that, that by cause let one interpret. He's saying, if the, you have to speak in tongues, then let there be two or three people who can interpret. At least when there are two or three, you cannot lie or say, you know, interpret, and then maybe something you had planned. There is that one to confirm, that one to confirm, the other one to confirm, if that message that you're speaking is true. And this one is for unknown tongues, okay? Not for a known tongue. A known tongue is not for believers, it's for the unbelievers, like I've told you. So if you're speaking in the different unknown tongues, let there be interpreter, interpreter, interpreter. That's the order of the Bible. It's saying that. All right. Mm-hmm. Listen, verse 29. Uh, okay, verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, listen, if there is no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Keep silence. Is that what they do in the Pentecostal churches? They don't keep silent. They shout and they prolong the service and it's one, one person or three or four people speaking tongues and they are prolonged every... It's really confusing, huh? All right, verse 29. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that seated by, let the first hold his peace. Okay? If somebody something is revealed to you in tongues, let the others keep peace and then you speak and then somebody can interpret what you're saying. All right? So that's that's the order, all right? Verse 31. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all churches and uh, of the saints. So the Bible is saying, God is not the author of confusion. He's not here to confuse people. He's not there to make people... Uh, be confused. What's really happening? What's that person saying? What's that person saying? No, he's a God of order. He likes order. So if God is a God of order, then why are these things changing? Why are these things changing? Why, why are people having, you see, many, many, many Pentecostal churches? It's all noise. You go there, it's really noise, confusion. There's no interpreter. And most of the people who make that noise are women. And we see what the, the Bible tells us about women in church. You see? <laughs> women are easily deceived into these things, speaking in tongues, and you know you have to do this. Uh, the Bible even says, gives rules to women when they're in church. It gives them specific rules. Let's see some of the rules. Just down there, verse 34. And it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they, but they are commanded to be under obedience and also as also says the law, if they will learn anything, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So you see most of these Pentecostal churches, actually they are led by women. It's literally women who are the pastors, they are doing that. You see, 
The family unit, God created it for a purpose. He said the man should be the head and the woman should be, uh, should be the neck. All right. So the woman should obey the man. So the man, according to God, is a, a nature of how Jesus is marrying the church. So Jesus is the head and then the church is following Jesus. But now... The, the people in Pentecostal churches, they have even changed that now. It's women leading the men. <laughs> is, that, is there a time that you're going to lead Christ? You know, Christ come here. This and this and this you have to do. Listen to me. Let me speak to you, Jesus. It's not like that. The marriage system is a format of how Jesus and the church is like. And when you see women leading in church, especially these Pentecostal churches, and they are the, the loudest people in the church where, where, when they are speaking in tongues and all those kind of things, you, you must know there is something confused here. There must be a confusion there. Because the Bible tells us God is not the author of confusion. Why are, why are women? You, you know people might say, you see uh, women, women this, women that. Uh, you know you're only speaking this out of your, maybe you don't want to hear. The, no, the Bible tells us why it does not literally want women speaking in church. Listen, go to 1 Timothy 2, 2.11 to around 15. The Bible repeats the same, same message. Let the woman keep silence in church with all subjection. It is even saying with all subjection. Many people will say, no, this is under the law. No, this is under the church age. And this is Paul speaking, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. So this is in our rightful dispensation, in our time. And Paul is insisting, with all subjection, women keep silence. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to unsup authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So the Bible is saying, if you're a woman, you're easily, you're much more easier to be deceived that, hey, this is how we get the Holy Spirit. You have to speak in tongues. You have to do this and this. And that's why you see most of the churches, women are really, really deceived. I'm not against women. You can always share the word of God with your children. You can always share with a, a, a certain believer. You can always share with someone else. But not to take leaderships in church. And this is what happens in the Pentecostal churches. And that's why you see there are so many divorces in churches nowadays. So many people can just divorce and say this and that. We saw uh, from the beginning of uh, the Pentecostal churches back in the days. We see so many women who have been church leaders and divorced. So many. We have, let me just count them. Kathleen Kuhlman, she was divorced, I don't know, several times. She was a leader of the Pentecostal church. Is the Bible telling us women to be leaders? Juanita Bynum. We have so many. I, I, I don't want to, to, to mention names as much, but let me just... Stay with those two. You know many, 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 many people who are leading in these Pentecostal churches, who are women, and it's different from what the Bible says. And that's why there's a lot of deception, and people are deceived to think that they, are, they, don't, have, they don't have the power of God because they cannot do this or that or this and that. No, that is totally a different thing. Tanks are signs to Jews, hmm? and the Gentiles live by faith, not by sight, all right? The other thing is the whole aspect of visions. Visions. All right? So many people in the Pentecostal churches claim to have seen some vision. You see, God has given me a vision about these guys. God has given me this. And some of the things that they see, they are contrary to the Bible. The Bible says one thing, then this guy says another thing. Some people say, you know, I got to... Just imagine somebody coming and saying, you see, God told me that we have to, you know, to do something so that we can be blessed or something so that we can get eternal life. And uh, or maybe somebody comes up with a, a new doctrine and says, I've seen a vision. Why do we have the Bible? What's the essence of us having the Bible? The Bible is the word of God. Everything which needed to be prophesied has already been prophesied from the beginning to the end. We have the end of the Bible. That is, it has given even 
what is going to happen after the 1000 years it's it's even prophesied even after here we are going to have this and this judge this is going to happen we are going to have the new earth and the new uh, heaven it's already prophesied everything so what was the reason of the prophets was to give the word of god because that time the bible had not been written we had only scrolls so god was always bringing out different prophets isaiah zechariah Ezekiel and all those so that they can prophesy the word of God they can say what God is saying what God is speaking to people he can they can be able to prophesy and say hey this is what God is saying but now we have already the bible even the bible itself <laughs> talks about prophets and and all those things. it says uh, the end of uh, the law and the prophets was until John the law and the prophets were until John John was around here so when Jesus came through, we are no longer under the law and the prophets. We are now under another different dispensation, dispensation of grace. So when you hear somebody say, I'm prophet this, I'm prophet that, I'm prophet this, I'm prophet that, you must be really careful about those guys who are speaking about, hey, I was given a vision, I was given this vision A, vision B. Be careful on those who keep on saying that, you know, God gave me vision. God does not change his word. He's always very true to his word. Okay? He's very, very true. Visions and signs and things to do with seeing are for Jews, not Gentiles. Gentiles believe by faith, not by sight. All right? We live by faith, not by sight. These things to do with visions and signs and God showed me this, God showed me that. I saw Paula White. She was talking about how she went to heaven and went to anoint, I don't know, the seat of God and did some very weird video. Just go on YouTube and check it out. What Paula White said. You see, Paula White is also another Pentecostal woman giving her stories which are contrary to the Bible. The Bible says, she was saying that, hey, I saw God, I saw the face of God. The Bible says, whosoever will see God shall die. So why is she doing there? You see, deception a lot of deception. So you have to be very, very careful on who you listen, all right? And there are some people in Pentecostal churches who say, no, 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 no. You see, you can't say that. In the last days, eh? Joel 2.28, most of them, they say, in the last days, your sons and daughters will see dreams and will see visions and they will prophesy and do all those kind of things. <laughs> My friend, this message was being spoken to the Jews. And they were being told what will happen during the time of the tribulation. And even Apostle Peter, Peter here, he also confirms it was for the Jews during the time of tribulation. What is going to happen? Let's, let's see there. Acts, the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, 16 to 21. Let's see. Hmm? He says, when now they had already started speaking, they spoke in tongues and then people were wondering, hey, these people are speaking in our languages and all those. Now Paul, I mean, uh, uh, Peter stands up and he, and he says this. He says uh, from uh, 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says the, uh, said God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens i will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and i will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire vapor or smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved now are we saved by calling the name on the lord of the lord or are we saved by the gospel right now we are saved by the gospel we are not saved by calling upon the name of the lord what if <laughs> let's let's imagine you're a carpenter you're you're hitting nails into maybe uh, some stool that you're making and all of a sudden it hits you and then you say jesus now are you saved because you have called upon the name of the lord are you saved no we are saved by the gospel so this one already tells you that this message was being spoken to the jews in the time of tribulation and we can even see down there the next verse, in verse 22, it says, Ye men of Israel. So, Peter already confirms, this message is to you men of Israel. Are you Israel? So, you see a lot of deception in this Pentecostal church. They are trying to show, hey, women can do this, women can do this, do this and this. I'm, 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 I'm not against women. 
I'm not against that. I know many people will want to uh, comment and tell me, you see, you're talking. We, no, 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 no. I'm only the, don't, don't hate the player. <laughs> hate, hate the one who wrote the whole game. All right? Don't hate me. Hate the one who wrote the Bible. That is the one. He gave his instructions. You can wake up and say, Keith, you're giving. No, no, no. I'm not giving my own words. I'm giving what the Bible is saying. And that's why it's very important to choose. Am I going to trust the Bible? Am I going to trust some traditions of men? What am I going to trust? And whatever you choose to trust, do it. Do it with all your might. All right? Do it with all your might. Actually, in chapter 2, the, the whole of chapter 2, Peter is talking to Jews. He's literally all this time is speaking to the Jews. To the Jews. He even insists and calls them by name. In verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel. Verse 29, he says, Men and brethren, who are men and brethren to Peter? They are people of his kindreds. Are you brethren to the Jews? No, they are his kindreds. Verse 36, house of Israel. Verse 37, men and brethren. So he's speaking to the Jews. So if it's not you, this is not your message, then <laughs> go to your rightful dispensation, the time of Paul. So stop saying that you have to speak in tongues. You have to do all this. No, these things are different. And if you have to speak in tongues, the Bible has already given us uh, the ideas and has already told us what you need to do, how you need to speak in tongues. All right. So the other thing is signs and wonders. Signs. Signs. And wonders, especially healings. All right. So, <laughs> this is very, very funny. Signs and wonders. So many people might, might, might ask themselves, why signs and wonders? What's so important about this topic? Is it that people cannot be healed today? Is it that people can, cannot get their... Uh, healing today? No, I'm not saying that. God heals us today by faith, not by some guy laying his hands on you. Before, during this time, we see so many people who are healed by someone laying hands on them. People are resurrected, people are uh, healed, people, demons were chased out and all those things happened. We even see Jesus himself raising people from the dead. You can say, okay, that is Jesus. No. What about we see uh, Ap Apostle Peter, we see the early apostles, we see Apostle Paul, we see all these people, they could raise the dead. Does a dead person have faith? Does he have faith? No. They had the power to, to raise the dead, to heal the sick and to do this and that. Even, it's, it's written. But right now, today, so many of these Pentecostal guys, they say that, hey, we have the gift of healing. <laughs> we have a healing ministry, healing this and that. Let's see. Let's see something here. Who had the power to heal? Who are give, given these gifts to heal? It was the apostles. The apostles were given these gifts. And one thing that you have to understand is that today we have no more apostles. When you see somebody calling him an apostle, himself an apostle, then you must be very careful who you're dealing with. The apostles ended. They ended. The last apostle was Paul. And I can prove you, uh, to you that. Because the apostles are the ones who were sent by Jesus Christ and they were told, go to every place, baptizing, healing the sick, raising the dead, doing this. You can touch serpents and they will not uh, harm you. You can drink poison. Today, can you drink poison? Can you touch a serpent and then it will not bite you? Can you raise the dead? Why are people not going to the morgues and raising the dead? Why are people not going to heal people who have corona all over? No. <laughs> Why? Because... This was for the apostles, and the apostles ended. Even Paul himself, he, as, he, as he was transitioning to the Gentiles, even the power of healing ended. I will show you in just a, a minute. First, let's see. Let, let's see exactly about uh, who had these signs. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 12. 12.12. Uh, 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. All right? So already we are seeing the apostles had signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the signs and wonders were for the apostles. Okay? And we see Paul was the last apostle. 
All right? He was the last apostle. He already tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 15, 8 to 9. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 8 to 9. Uh, and, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. He's saying that Jesus saw he. I mean... Uh, um, He's saying that he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He's saying I am actually the least of the apostles like one born out of due season. The time, the season of the apostles was almost getting over. And Paul was born out of due season, due season, almost towards the end. And even the Bible tells us very well that when the millennial kingdom starts, we will have the new Jerusalem with 12 foundations, the foundations of the 12 apostles of God. Let's see, Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So why don't we have the names of the 2 million apostles in the world? No. The 12 apostles who are the foundations. The 12 apostles formed the foundation of the church. The whole main cornerstone being Jesus Christ. And the 12 foundations of the, of the church was set after Jesus was set by the apostles. So they will be here, the foundation of the new Jerusalem. So why don't we have your name here if you are an apostle? Why don't we have you counted there? Yeah? Even Revelation 2.2 2 tells us some of these people who they are. The Bible says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and they are not and hast found them liars. So, so many people are saying I am an apostle. But the Bible says, <laughs> you have tested these guys. This, this is speaking to the church of, uh, is, uh, which church is, one of the seven churches is being spoken to. They are saying, hey. We know you have already tested these guys who are calling themselves apostles and you have found they are liars, all right? Why? Because the apostles faded out as well as their signs and wonders. Their signs and wonders of healings and all that faded out. And what remains now is faith. Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Let's see what it says. Eh? Charity never faileth. But where, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. All right? So we are told that the tongues will vanish. All these things will vanish. Hmm? Prophecies shall fail. And the tongue shall cease. Knowledge shall vanish away. But what will remain? Faith. Faith is going to remain. Faith is going to remain. And if faith is going to remain, then it means uh, that's all we have at this time of the Gentiles. So it's really, really impo uh, impossible for you to be looking for signs. And we are told we are already living at the time of faith. We are living at the time of faith. Faith is what, uh, faith is what God has promised us at this time, at this dispensation. Actually, by the end of Paul's ministry here, <laughs> by the end of Paul's ministry. Already we see very, very well that Paul had no more power remaining. Paul had no more power remaining. Let's see. 2 Timothy 4.20. Paul says with his own words, uh, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left up in Letham sick. So if Paul is leaving someone sick <laughs> and he had all this power to heal and all these kind of things, then it means that the gifts have already faded away. Before, Paul was really, really powerful. And I can confirm that to you in Acts 11, 12. Acts, 11, uh, uh, Acts 19, sorry, uh, from verse 11 to 12. And, it's, and it says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick, handkerchief or aprons and diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. So we see very, very well that just from a, you know, handkerchief or an apron, <laughs> Paul, 
he, he could be brought uh, these aprons and uh, handkerchief and and send them back to the people who are sick and they were healed instantly it was really powerful and we see right now people trying to reciprocate that especially people in the pentecostal trying to sell handkerchiefs to sell to sell um, they are called what anointing oils and doing all these kind of things and saying hey use this you will be healed uh, it, it, <laughs> You see, we are living in a time of faith. We are not living at a time of those signs and wonders and those people having to heal others. No. When you see somebody selling to you oil and another one selling to you a handkerchief or selling you this and that, or I even saw another, another big, big preacher here, here in Kenya. He was saying, hey, you have to go and uh, take a photo of any dream car that you want from the streets and bring that photo. Or go and get uh, soil from... Uh, it's called what? From the place where you want to get land. And then I will pray to that. So you see, all the, the, they seem to me like rituals. They don't seem to me like what the Bible says. And you have to rightfully divide the word of God and understand what was being spoken at what time. You see, there's even this other pastor. <laughs> he was saying that, hey, pay, pay how much? Pay 10,000. I don't need 10,000 or 1,000 so that he can confirm if your name is in the book of life in heaven. You see all those fellas, they're just eating your money. They're just lying to you. They don't have those gifts. They are liars. They are liars. And when you see people calling them, say, hey, I'm apostle this, I'm apostle that. Remember what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. The Bible tells us about those fellas. It says, for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore is no great thing that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works so the Bible says don't be just swayed by any guy who comes saying I'm apostle this I'm apostle this I'm apostle that no those are lies. They are lies. They are lies. They are lies. They are lies. The apostles ended. Apostles faded. They are no longer there. Apostles used to show these miracles and signs and healings and all that. Tell one pastor to take you uh, to a corona ward and go and heal people there. They won't. They'll be scared even themselves. They'll go to that ward wearing masks, fearing. All right? So don't be deceived by these people. Don't be deceived. Most of these healing meetings are not healings. You, you're, you're, you're healed by your faith. You're not healed by someone touching you. You're not healed by the people that you think they will heal you. No, that is a lie. That's a big, big lie. The other thing that I'll speak about is the Pentecostals believe you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. So if you can lose your salvation, then why, why does God say a salvation is eternal? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you understand the word eternal? Eternal. Do you understand the word everlasting? All right. Everlasting, eternal. What is the meaning of these two words? They mean that something which is eternal or everlasting, it's forever. It is forever and ever. You can lose something which is eternal. Jesus does not say, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but I'll give him salvation or life until you sin. No, eternal life. I'm not advocating for sin. But what I'm advocating is... Don't let people live in condemnation. 24-7 you're condemned. You're in Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation. Once you're saved, you're saved. Being saved is like being born. Can you say, I'm not really sure if I'm born or not. I don't know if my mother was really serious telling me that I was born. You even know the day that you're born. Salvation is like marriage. Can you say, I'm wearing this ring, but I don't really know if this is really my wife. I don't even, I'm not even sure these are my kids. I'm, I don't know if I'm really married. You have the certificate, you'll be married. You're sure, you even know the day that you're married. Salvation assures us several things. When you get saved, you become an adopted child of God, a son of God, a child of God. Now, when you're a child, can you be 
unadopted? Can you be unchilded? I don't know how to put it that way. You're a child, you're a child. You're a child of God, you're a child of God. Nothing can change that. It is once and for all, all right? They are good children and they are bad children. And those bad children, God, Jesus says that, hey, I chasteth, I, 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 you know, correct those that I love. I correct them. I let them go through struggles, let them go through things. The wages of sin is death. When you, they do something wrong, their flesh will die. But their soul will be rescued. You can't lose your salvation. How do you lose your salvation? When you do something wrong and you continue, God gives you to a reprobate mind. And he says, continue what you want to do. But remember, the wages of sin is death. You're going to die. Your flesh is going to die. You are to live maybe 80 years. You, you become a bank robber because you say, ah, I got saved. I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, God will not take your bullets. When you start being shot by the police, you will die. You will die. Definitely you will die. And uh, remember, if you are a child and a child, you have adopted a child and he starts being a thief and he's shot by the police or killed by mob justice, he will still be buried at your home. He's still your child. You sign those papers, you adopted the child, he's still your child. All right. So the Bible is the same. You will become a child as long as you believe the gospel, you trust in the gospel. And I'll be speaking about the gospel in just a minute. You trust in the gospel, you trust with your whole heart. You don't have to do anything else. You see, there's a very big difference between salvation and works. These people, they try to make salvation a salvation of works. You have to be saved and then you do something to maintain it. You have to be saved and do something or else you will lose it. No, there's nothing you can do to give yourself salvation. There's nothing. We are saved by the finished work of Christ at the cross. The Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. So how are you going to say, I'm so righteous, I do this and this and this. How can you weigh I'm doing good things than bad things? How can you weigh and say this is the good and this is the bad? No. The Bible says walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. Why? Because when you walk in the flesh, you will go to carnal things. But walk in the spirit, do the things of the spirit. Do you, you, There is a new man inside you who is saved. When you're saved, you become a new creature. A creature is a very different thing from the old one. You can't lose your salvation. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise inside you. And already you see, when you are sealed, how can you be unsealed? When I seal something and close from inside and I throw the key away, or I give someone the key, who will open? The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you are sealed up to the day of redemption. So the Bible says you are sealed to the day of redemption. Alright? Redemption. So he says you are sealed up to this day. This is the day of redemption, the day of the rapture, when you shall be redeemed of this sinful body. And even Paul says, those things that I do, I, 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 I don't want to do them. But those things that I don't do, uh, it's the ones that, I mean, the, the bad things I find myself doing them. And the good things which I'm supposed to do, I find myself not doing them. Who will deliver me from this body of sin? Even him, he was struggling, he was saying, I always find myself doing this, I always find myself doing this. Oh God, please help me, deliver me from this. Because God, when you're saved, he doesn't see you. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. We have something called the, the, uh, the imputed righteousness. We have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ in us. How can you lose your salvation? How? So these guys, they preach that you have, you can lose your salvation. Is it really true? Can you lose your salvation and then you're rededicated again? Because that's what happens. You lose your rededicated. Come here. Whoever wants to be rededicated, come here. You're rededicated, you lose, you rededicated, you lose, you... Is that what says uh, the Bible? Can you get the Holy Spirit and then is off, Holy Spirit off? Uh, let's see what, what the Bible says in Hebrews 6.4 <clears throat> concerning losing your salvation. Hebrews 6.4 to around 6. The Bible says, eh? For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tested the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tested the good word of God and the powers of the world to come... If, see what the Bible is saying, if, if they shall fall away to renew them again and to repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the son of God afresh, and put him into an open shame. He's saying, if you lose, you can get the Holy Spirit back. So these rededication services, 
I, no, you have to be you have to be very careful. When somebody tells you come here rededicate, you had lost it. You only lose something that you've given un- uh, yourself. Only something that you've given yourself is what you can lose. You can lose something that Jesus has given you? No. How can you lose something that Jesus has given you? How? How can you be able to lose it? You see salvation is kept by Jesus Christ. I don't have time to time to explain all those things, but <clears throat> what is the gospel? You believe the gospel? Gospel, what is the gospel? It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you believe in this gospel, then you're saved once and for all. You can never lose your salvation because you trust. You trust in the finished work of Christ at the cross. What is the gospel? It speaks about how Christ died. All right. Well, uh, for our sins, sorry, for our sins. You see, Christ did not die for any other thing, but for our sins, was buried, rose again, according to the scriptures all right so christ died for our sins was buried rose again according to the scriptures first corinthians 15 1 through 4 let me finish with this let me finish with this first corinthians 15 1 through 4 that is the gospel if you believe this then you're saved moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel not the gospels you see matthew mark john and luke those are the gospels Still Jesus was on the earth. The Bible says a testament is effected by the death of the testator. That is according to the book of Hebrews. So if the testator, Jesus Christ, was still alive, then those are called the gospels, not the gospel. The gospel is here, okay? The gospel according to Paul. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which you also have received, and wherein you stand. You have to receive the gospel, and you have to stand in the gospel. By which also you are saved. You are saved by this gospel. If you keep in memory, it has to be here. What I preached unto you. Unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain is what? Believing in vanity. Believing in things that you do. Believing this is what saves me and is something that you only do. That is believing in vain. Believing in your own self. Vanity. For I delivered unto you first of all which I also received. So Paul is saying, I'm not giving you my gospel. I'm giving you something which I also received. How that Christ died. You see that one word? How. How that Christ died. How did Jesus die? How? How did Jesus die? He died a very, very bloody death. He shed his blood. He shed a lot of blood for you. He shed a lot of blood. So how that Christ died? You see, most of these Pentecostals, they first, many, many of them, they can't even tell you where the gospel is. And number two, most of them, they use... They don't use the, 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 the King James Version. They, they just say, we, you say you can use any Bible as long as this word how is only this word how. It's only in the King James Version, authorized 1611, authorized version. But they use all NIVs and all those because this word is missing. So they don't know how. They just think it's another story because... It's all about confusion. How is very important. If you don't know how Jesus died, you will think, you know, I just believe in Jesus. <laughs> I believe in, listen, the Bible says even devils believe and tremble. But you have to follow the gospel by understanding how Christ died. All right. How Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried and that he rose again third day, according to the scriptures. So it's really, really important. You have to understand that. This is the gospel, is what saves you. I don't know, I think I've finished my, my teaching today. Whoever wants to believe, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But for me, 30 years I stayed in this religion and it really almost messed me up, almost taking me every day condemnation, thinking that, hey, I think I have to do something to be saved. But the moment I knew the truth, my life was never the same again. Believe the gospel and you'll be saved. And uh, do whatever you can be able to do. Because the Bible said, whosoever shall believe the gospel, he shall be saved. How that Christ died. God bless you and have a good time.